Take a look around me, and I mean I really want you to take it all in. What you see is a war, a battle, that every man, woman, and child that has ever lived has fought. And I can assure you that it's very real. And much like the Civil War, World War II, and Vietnam, this war has a name. Some don't want you to see it. Some don't want you to believe it. Some even say that it's not biblical. I'm talking about something called the Great Controversy Worldview that some Christians and some ex-Adventists say is a figment of Ellen White's imagination and makes her a false prophet, and that those of us who believe in the great controversy have been had, hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, and run amok. Of course, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but that's how many people feel. As a matter of fact, you may even see it in the comment section of this video or other videos. And today, I want to try to dispel the myth that Ellen White concocted the great controversy worldview in her own mind. We're going to see it by using one book, and it's not this book, The Great Controversy. We will be using the book that The Great Controversy merely magnifies, and that book is the Bible. And I'm going to start today by referencing a movie, the movie Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. And in this movie, a very interesting interaction takes place between Superman and Lex Luthor. In this scene, Lex Luthor expresses his frustration about Superman and his role as a god. This conversation is pretty much an exact copy of some of the thoughts that people have had towards God for thousands of years, especially atheists. And that thought is that God cannot be all powerful and all good at the same time. Let's take a look. The problem of, of evil in the world. The problem of you on top of everything else. You above all. Ah, because that's what God is. Horus, Apollo, Jehovah, Kal-El. Because God is tribal. God takes sides. No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fists and abominations. Mm -hmm. I figured out way back. God is all powerful. He cannot be all good. And if he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. And neither can you be. Seventh-day Adventists have identified this mindset and attitude towards God as something called the Great Controversy. And we've taught this worldview for over a hundred years. In our opinion, this worldview answers so many questions asked by atheists, agnostics, and people of other faiths and religions, including many Christians. And it is this worldview that is often mocked by other Christians as a fallacy and a fantasy made up by Ellen White. The claim made by Seventh-day Adventists, like yours truly, is that there is definitely a battle taking place all around us, and it's a battle for this right here, my mind and your mind. I make no apologies for believing what I'm about to show you, and as a matter of fact, I firmly believe that it is the only way to explain why God has not yet put evil and suffering to an end. I'm going to read the official SDA beliefs about the great controversy so that you can see it for yourself and make your decision regarding whether or not it's logical or reasonable. But before I do, I want to show you a clip from the comedian George Carlin, who was raised as a Roman Catholic, then became an atheist later in his life. Or some would say he was an anti-theist who openly mocked the God that he believed did not exist. Now I'm going to warn you, some of you will see what I'm about to show you as blasphemous. Some of you may even get angry at me for sharing a clip like this but you need to see it. You need to understand how people feel towards God because this is going to help us understand this thing called the great controversy. You have to stand in awe, in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. No contest, no contest. Religion, religion easily has the greatest story ever told. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man <laughs> living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day. And the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do. <laughs> and if you do any of these 10 things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. 
He loves you and he needs money. <laughs> All right, I get it. I can already feel that some of you may be pretty upset with me right now. How dare he show a clip like that mocking God? It's because that God does not exist. There is no God that exists, that wants your money, that only cares about 10 rules that if you don't do them, he's going to burn you and torture you forever, but that loves you. The thought of a God that loves you and yet would burn you forever and ever is ridiculous. And that's why those people laugh like that, because that concept is hilarious and it doesn't make any sense. And yet, this is exactly the kind of God that the majority of the Christian world, including many Catholics and many Protestants, are teaching. This is the kind of God that is being presented to the world, a God that eternally tortures. It's false doctrines like an eternally burning hell that misrepresents the character of God that has played a huge role in creating animosity against God and creating many of the atheists that we see in the world today. It's true that those who reject Christ's sacrifice and his love will be punished for their sins, but the Bible does not teach that the suffering will be eternal. The Bible teaches that sin and sinners will be burned up never to exist again, but that's a topic for another day. Today, it's about the great controversy. So let's find out which is true, which is more reasonable, which is more logical, that there is a great war between Christ and Satan and that God is waiting for humanity to make a decision about who he is in order to bring sin to an end and suffering to an end or some other option. Today we're going to do this by temporarily putting to the side the book, The Great Controversy. I will not be throwing that book away because I believe this book is very special. But what I am going to do is show that Ellen White did not just make up the worldview of The Great Controversy out of thin air. It's all throughout scripture and you will see it for yourself just from the Bible with no spirit of prophecy quotes. So let's start by reading the official Seventh-day Adventist belief about the great controversy. It says, all humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being endowed with freedom of choice in self-exaltation became Satan, God's adversary and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the created world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood as presented in the historical account of Genesis 1 through 11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. So that's the fundamental belief number eight of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's the great controversy worldview in a nutshell. And it's up to you to decide if you think it's biblical or not. I'm convinced that it is, but you have to make your own decision. So let's see the principles of this worldview. Number one, there's a controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. Number two, the controversy started in heaven. Number three, Satan wanted to exalt himself and he led many angels into rebellion against God. Number four, Satan introduced the war to this earth and deceived humanity into rebellion against God. Number five, the image of God was distorted in humanity. Number six, the controversy is being observed by all of creation, and this earth has now become the center of the war. Number seven, God will ultimately be vindicated in the eyes of everyone, good and evil. Today, we're going to put these points to the test. We're going to see if it's biblical and decide whether we should keep it or if we should join in with those who are laughing at it and mocking it and throw it away. People have questions about God and his character, and there is a clear explanation for that. Satan has been promoting a false picture of God on this earth for thousands of years, and all of humanity has at some point been in rebellion against God. You can see it in Romans chapter eight that talks about the carnal mind being at enmity with God, meaning that it hates God. This is what the great controversy is all about. It's a war between two adversaries, a war between two ideas about the character of God. As a matter of fact, 
The name Satan is simply what is called a transliteration of the Hebrew word for adversary, Satan. So when we say Satan or Satan, we are actually saying adversary. And clearly, if there is an adversary, then there must be an opposing party and there must be some kind of fight or war. And that's exactly the story that the Bible presents. In the book of Revelation, we get a picture of the war in chapter 12, which says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. From this verse, we can clearly see that there was a war in heaven between Christ and Satan, and this war included other beings besides humans. According to the verses, this war included deception, and as a result, Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. So what kind of war was this? Was it a physical war with swords or lightsabers? Well, the Greek word for war can give us a hint, and that word is polemos. It means a war, a fight, a battle, a dispute, a strife, a quarrel, or dare I say, a controversy. This war is a war of ideas. It's a war of opinions about God. This animosity against God started with Satan, and we can know this by the recorded words of Satan in the Bible. There are only two times in the Bible that we actually get to directly hear Satan speak regarding God and what he thinks about God. One is in the Garden of Eden, and one is in the book of Job. And we'll start by taking a look at the book of Job, where it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The audacity. Satan, who has been kicked out of heaven, hears about a meeting taking place and has the nerve to show up at the meeting. This is like someone being fired from a job and then showing up for the next board meeting. This is some bold stuff going on right here. But here's the thing. God lets Satan into the meeting. And not only that, but he lets him speak. And the interaction goes like this. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Again, the audacity of it all. As the fancy people say, the sheer hubris. Not only does Satan show up to the meeting, but he slanders God in front of everyone, suggesting that God is some sort of a sugar daddy who is bribing Job for his love, and that Job doesn't really love God just for who he is, but that Job is only serving God because God has made him rich, famous, and wealthy. Everyone is there. Everyone is watching. Everyone is listening to what he has to say. It's like a tennis match, back and forth, forth and back as God and Satan interact. And here's the thing, God does not close Satan's mouth. He doesn't stop him from slandering his name. He lets him speak. Even the creators of the show Superbook understand this to a certain extent, as the episode dealing with Job does a great job of presenting Satan, slandering God before the angelic host and the sons of God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. <gasps> and why did God allow it? Because God knows that in the end, his character will indeed be vindicated. God knows that in the end, everyone will say, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. And by the way, just a side note, that's why I don't censor comments on my videos. In a public forum, if God didn't even censor Lucifer, then I figure, why should I censor people, even if I don't agree with them? But back to our search. In chapter two, 
the exact same scenario is presented, another meeting, another challenge, and the exact same charges are made. And this is the point. There are absolutely no humans there. Job has no idea he's being talked about. As a matter of fact, humanity has no idea that it's being talked about. The war, this, dare I say, controversy, is taking place behind the scenes. But Satan is slandering God in front of the angelic host and the other sons of God. And Satan is also slandering and accusing humanity as well. This part of the controversy is on full display in Revelation 12, verse 10, which says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. In this verse, Satan is identified as the accuser of the brethren. He's identified as a slanderer. And just like Jesus put it in John 8, verse 44, when speaking of Satan, he says, Satan was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. I've heard it in so many churches. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. And he was a liar from the beginning when he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he did so by making an attack on God's character. Sometimes the story of the Garden of Eden is passed by without truly understanding the magnitude of what happened. Oh, Adam and Eve just ate a fruit. What's the big deal? But there is so much that happened there that we need to understand. If you read the story with fresh eyes, you will see Satan's main purpose pouring off the pages. Genesis 3 verse 1, it says, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Think about this for a moment. What is this question suggesting about God? You shall not eat of every tree. It's saying that God is restrictive. Let's go on. God had told Adam and Eve that if they ate from the tree, they would die. And in verse 4, it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. In other words, he's saying that God is a liar. And finally, in verse 5, Satan says, For God knows that in the day ye eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan is saying, God knows that this fruit will make you reach your full potential, and he's trying to hold something back from you. He's trying to keep you from reaching your full happiness. So according to Satan, God is restrictive, he's a liar, and he's trying to hold us back and keep us from complete happiness. Question, have you ever felt those thoughts or emotions about God? Have you ever felt like God is restrictive or that he's keeping you from something that would be good for you? This is what led Eve and Adam into sin. It was this misrepresentation about who God is that made them question God and make the choice to sin. This misunderstanding about God's character is at the root of all sin. And in order for sin to be dealt with eternally, these thoughts have to be dealt with. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the great controversy in a nutshell. That's why we're still here because each and every one of us is still deciding who this God really is. Ellen White did not make this up. The Adventist church did not make this up. It's all throughout scripture. The prophet Habakkuk experienced the war regarding the character of God when he got frustrated about his perceived thought that God was not properly dealing with pain and suffering. As he said, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Habakkuk is arguing with God and questioning God as to why he is not ending sin and suffering. The prophet Nahum experienced it when God asked him the question, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. In other words, God was asking Nahum, and he's asking you and I, what do you think about me? And he was also letting Nahum know that all this, all this sin, it will not happen a second time. It won't happen again. It's because of Satan's lies that God has to deal with all of these false opinions about him. And I want to show you why. As I said earlier, there's only a few times in the Bible that we actually hear Satan speak. The last one is when he tempts Christ in the wilderness and the other two we've already covered one from the Garden of Eden and the other at some meeting place in or around heaven in the story of Job. The words are very short. The words are very condensed, but really, that's all we need. 
Those words serve as the core or the kernel of how Satan feels about God. Satan has been promoting the idea that God is not good and that he is not trustworthy. And it is this lie that was communicated in the Garden of Eden to Eve and to the angels in heaven as well. According to Revelation 12 verse 4, it says that Satan's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. This is symbolic language about the devil and his influence. Revelation 1 verse 20 lets us know that the stars represent angels. And Isaiah 9 verse 15 lets us know that the elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. According to scripture, Satan is like a dragon and his tail is his lies and his slander. Both times that he speaks in the Bible regarding God is to try to deceive humanity and the angelic host that he thinks God is restrictive, a liar, and that he is keeping things from us and that he is not worthy of our love and obedience. It should be clear that there is indeed a war between Christ and Satan. It should be clear that God's character is being attacked and that his rules or commandments are also being attacked. The controversy started in heaven. The war has been brought to this earth. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And that word spectacle in the Greek is theatron, which means a theater, a place in which games and dramatic spectacles are exhibited and public assemblies held, a public show. Men are watching, the universe is watching, and we are deciding who God is. In my humble opinion, I believe that we have seen all of the principles from this SDA belief laid out in scripture. However, this is not just about some doctrine that Seventh-day Adventists believe in. And if a Seventh-day Adventist has shared it like that, then I'm sorry you heard it that way, because there are bigger fish to fry than just a list of doctrines. This is about God and his character. This is about Christ and his love for humanity. And all of our doctrines should be presented through that lens. This is how we can reboot Adventism and present our truths through the lens of the love and character of God. The war for minds is raging. People are deciding. And once everyone decides, God will bring this controversy to an end. And contrary to popular belief, it is indeed a great controversy. And I am unapologetic about holding that worldview. If you want to dig into this topic a little bit more, then check out our video entitled, Why Didn't God Destroy Satan? And another one entitled, Why Does He Want to Kill God? In order to get a deeper insight into this controversy and how Satan promotes the principles of the great controversy. And if you want to support this ministry, then don't forget to share, comment, and subscribe to get these digital tracks to as many people as possible. I pray that you will come to see the true loving nature of God and choose the right side in the controversy between Christ and Satan. Hope to see you again. God bless.